you can get calories and caffeine in a bit. But Nathan Vela, currently president of Cappy, I believe is his title. Cappy's been around seven, eight years. They've successfully thrown off the shackles of publisher funding and have, are now doing more and more of their own stuff, including the awesome Swords and Sorcery. Who here's played this? <laughs> Who here's stuck on Android and wishes they could play it? Yeah. Suckers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and with that, Nathan will take it away. Nathan Bell, everybody. Thank you. All righty. Uh, we'll just uh, switch over the hit two. Okay. I'm hit. No, not two. One. Go, oh, all right, we got, we got a dancing naked bear, that's perfect. <laughs> all righty, so we'll just, if you want, you can just take a peek at that for a little bit. <laughs> okay, doke, so a uh, very quick introduction because introductions are not interesting. I'm Nathan Vela, I'm the co-founder and president of Cappy. Uh, you can follow me on the Twitters. So, uh, he, much in the way of uh, Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery EP, I have a nice and long title uh, for this talk. Uh, it's called uh, Perhaps a Time of Miracles Was at Hand, the Business and Development of Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery EP with Songs and Sounds by Jim Guthrie. Um, really, though, it's like a super long-winded way for me to say that I'm going to dis uh, discuss what I think were some of the most useful learnings on the business and development side of the game. Um, so this talk is kind of iOS focused, obviously. How many people here have uh, made, are making, planning to make, or eventually think they will make an iOS game? All right, so this is relevant. I feel much better about myself now. Um, thank you for not going to the iOS talks and instead being here. Um, so Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery had a whole bunch of people involved. Uh, Super Brothers is Craig. Craig's over there. Uh, Cappy's creative director, Chris, played a huge role. Chris is around here somewhere. There was a couple programmers, John Maher and Frankie Leung. Um, we had some QA people that helped out a little bit. My role was a little bit different. Uh, I, I actually didn't really ever touch the game. I, I didn't really make the game. Um, instead, I focused my efforts on ensuring the project was a development and business su success. Uh, and while, you know, using the word miracle is a little bit of an exaggeration, it was still kind of a miraculous event for, for everyone involved. So this is my favorite slide of the talk. Uh, it's where I brag a whole lot. Um, so, but it's actually really important because I want to qualify why I think that this game was a success. Um, and I think it's kind of an important thing to, to recognize because there's different components of the success and they all kind of feed into the business and development. So first of all, it sold over 350,000 copies in the just under a year that it's been available. Uh, that's crazy. Um, it's been rated a ton and most of those are five star reviews, which is super awesome. Um, Sorcery got a ton of critical praise. Uh, that made us feel really good about ourselves, Metacritic lists, all kinds of fun awards. Um, and one of the more interesting things is not only did the mainstream kind of gaming press cover it, but the non-gaming press and the more typical mainstream press covered it as well. The London Times, the New York Times, Mashable, Fast Company, a whole bunch of music blogs, even a ton of art sites covered sorcery seriously, uh, not just as a video game, but of a piece, as a piece of culture. Um, and lastly, Sorcery has been cited many times in the important discussions surrounding games as a medium, the massive and insane games as art debate, uh, and in also the amazing disposability of iOS games debate. So does anybody want me to give this slide again? Yeah, I really like this slide a lot. <laughs> Can I? Okay, I won't. I'll skip it. So the big question here is how did we turn a woefully risky project into a big success? What were the kind of like the key points and how did we leverage those key points? Um, now let me kind of again go back into qualifying stuff. Why do I think this was a woefully risky project? Um, it's not an arcade game. Uh, it's not twitchy. It's not stappy, snappy. It's not the style of game you typically see in the top 10 or top 20 or top 100 of the App Store charts. Um, you know, some people might play it on the toilet, but very few people, I think, played it significant periods of time on the toilet, unlike a lot of iOS games. Um, it's relatively long form. It's not built for micro play sessions. While you could, you could sit down and play it for one screen at a time. That's not the way the experience was meant to be had, and I don't think that that's the way the game entices you to experience it. 
Um, from the development perspective, it was a really long iOS project. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people have heard a lot of talk about iOS games being developed in one month or one month or two months or, you know, if you're Zach Gage, like six hours. Um, so for us to go over 1.5 years was extremely risky and also very rare. Um, it had a very, very large comparative to a lot of iOS games budget. Even with the collaborative development style, the budget still ended up probably around $200,000, which is nothing to balk at when dealing in the iOS space. Um, another big risk on the project was the fact that it was a uh, first game for both Super Brothers and for Jim Guthrie. Um, obviously, first projects are extremely hard, um, and everybody who's gone through that, pro that process of making their first game, uh, you know that it's a, a, a very dangerous rabbit hole to go down. Um, and to have two people going down that rabbit hole at the same time on the same project provides a heck of a lot of risk. Um, now, the game itself is often obscure. Uh, it's intentionally self-aware. And the single biggest focus on the game uh, is, is style and music. Um, all of those should set off huge warning alarms when we're thinking about the iOS space. Um, also, there is a relatively small amount of birds. There is pretty much no fruit, and there's very little water. Uh, anybody who looks at the charts will understand that that's a joke. All right, so let's, let's look into a few of the, 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 these, you know, specifically. Um, now, anybody, we, we gave a talk at Indiecade that kind of covered a bit of the collaboration process, but for any of you who are there, sorry, I'm going to repeat a bunch of this, but deal with it. Um, so first and perhaps the most important aspect of sorcery that led to us making a standout game and a successful game was how we leverage collaboration. Of course, collaboration isn't anything new in the independent scene, but I do think it's A, one of the opportunities that's most unique to the independent scene, and B, I think a lot of the collaboration in the independent scene happens kind of nepotistically where developer A and developer B get together. In the case of sorcery, it was collaboration between uh, an artist, illustrator, designer, and a musician who had never made music for games. Um, and I think that it's also important to, to say that this was actually, you know, true collaboration. This was people getting together in a room and listening to the, the, the ideas that they each had. Jim's role on the project wasn't just like, you make music. Jim would come down to the studio, sit in on meetings, and provide real quantifiable um, feedback and, and, and ideas for the game itself. So why is collaboration so important to business? And how does collaboration uh, increase the chances for business success? Um, well, first, uh, there's a really important point here that, that I need to make, and it's making games that stand out is surprisingly important for the business side of, of game development, especially for independent developers. Um, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things where making a game is just as much about making a game that you care about as it is about making a game that you care about enough to make it stand out. Um, and so what we did was we brought in different people that provided new perspectives uh, on the actual development process. So the game's director, artist, and writer, Super Brothers, and the game's musician, Jim Guthrie, actually came in and provided their own unique piece of standout power and actually built that into the game from the very ground up. So collaboration with Jim gave us standout music, but it also provided this unique perspective that we could make a game about music, that we could actually develop an entire, an entire title around the music itself. Um, next, uh, using collaboration as a core business and development component means that the vision of the game is inherently built into the team. You don't have an idea, build a team around it, and hope that you can spread that idea and vision out to the people in the team. The people in the team are the vision. Um, there's a lot of time and a lot of money spent uh, trying to convince people what the game is about, trying to convince you know, employees or friends that you're working with that what your idea really is. But since the genesis of sorcery was you know, people coming together and collaborating on an idea, it meant that no one ever had to really question what the idea was. And it really, even though later on I'm going to talk about how much uh, we went over budget and over schedule and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this part of it, I think, actually saved us a ton of development time and a ton of money because we didn't have to worry that nobody got it. Now, speaking straight from the, like, pay and money standpoint, collaboration has a huge benefit. Everyone shares the financial risk. They share in the opportunity. And they also share in the opportunity cost. 
So basically, A, it means that if you get people to truly collaborate with you, you can find ways to solve the I don't have enough money to make my game because everybody can get in from the ground up and, and know that making something together is, is, is the benefit, has the ability to build a financial success. Um, collaboration also adds a lot of firepower. It means you get the supreme talent without having to actually go out and hire them. Um, so when we started the project, we immediately got uh, my favorite pixel artist without having to go out and look for a favorite pixel artist for the project. Um, you, don't have to shove, also, you also don't have to shove an employee or a friend into a role that they don't fit. It means that uh, if you have an amazing uh, chiptunes musician who's your best friend or something, and you really, want him, you really want music for your project, but you really want that music to be you know, ambient or, uh, or maybe some like drum and bass or something, uh, you don't have to force them to make something that they're not actually good at. Um, and that really does avoid the risk of somebody really resenting the situation that they're in on a project. Um, now, a really scary part about collaborating is the fact that you're likely adding people to a game that have never actually made a game before. Um, and especially when you're talking about collaboration with people outside of the indie dev scene. Um, while Super Brothers had spent a bunch of time toiling away at Koi Canada, he had never actually made a full game. Uh, Jim had never actually made music for a game, although he had made different formats of music for commercials or for him, his, himself. Um, but the good thing is the risk can actually be mitigated because you're adding experienced people or somebody who's made a project before and kind of having those people back those people up. You know, when, when, when mistakes are made, somebody's there to say, like, you know, hey, no worries, here's the direction we can actually go. Um, and I think that in a kind of weird way, although for a significant part of the project uh, we weren't doing this, uh, I think that, you know, Cappy's having, Cappy having made iOS games before solved some of the inexperienced problems that we had um, with, you know, bringing fresh people into making a game. Um, all right, let's move forward. So now there's, there's a kind of an interesting distinction that I'd like to make here. And the distinction is there's, there's you know, collaboration and there's contributors. Um, and, and another really huge component of uh, the success of Sword and Sorcery was that we opened up the development of the game and almost the entire development process to contributors. It's a no cost, no risk, high reward bonus to having friends. And the best way that we could possibly think of to you know, find contributors was to go out for a beer with people, talk about the project with people, make some friends with people. And then if they were at all interested, figure out if they were interested enough to help us out a little bit here and there. Um, so, for example, uh, our buddy Corey Schmitz decided, oh, I, you know, we're, we're all friends, and can I contribute to the project? Oh, I'll make this awesome print that you can see right here that ended up in the first run of the Sword and Sorcery LP. Or my pal Ron Carmel, I could send him a message and say, I have no fucking clue what I'm doing, Ron, save me. And Ron would offer a piece of advice, and we could figure stuff out. And it meant that uh, none of these people were costing money, none of these people were doing it for the wrong reasons, and all of them were providing um, a, a real tangible benefit to the project. So we're going to have some fire flame effects going on here. Um, so people like Brandon Boyer, Robert Ashley, Corey Schmitz, Scientific, Ron Carmel, Charlie Intra, Clive Holden, Mark Rabo, Craig's brother, Mac, um, even people like Penn Ward, who makes Adventure Time, all got in touch with us or were friends of ours that we got in touch with. And we could actually, you know, when we had a question, we could find an answer that wasn't just uh, coming from internally. And I think that's also super important because everybody knows that at a certain point in your project, uh, you're so deep in your project that you don't know what you're doing. You don't know if it's good. You don't know if there's even an end to it. So having those outside perspectives really help a lot. Uh, that's Mark Rabo doing a pop of wheelie, by the way. He's, he's a badass. Um, so another kind of like weird thing, and I, and I always kind of feel strange talking about this because it sounds like I'm totally using people, um, and maybe we were. Um, but one of these weird benefits of having people contribute to your projects is it grows the number of eyeballs on your project, and it grows them in the best possible way. Contributors, contributors will only contribute to your project if they actually believe in the project. So no one's going to donate time or effort or something awesome to a project that they think sucks. Um, and if they believe in those projects, 
they're going to talk about that project. They're going to be interested in being involved and interesting, or interested in spreading their involvement. Um, we had a whole ton of people comment that they couldn't believe that Logfellow was actually voiced by Robert Ashley. Um, and that was something that got talked a lot, about a lot. And that was, that was a, a, an amazing scenario where, you know, Craig talks to Robert Ashley, Robert Ashley decides to, you know, record a whole bunch of joke statements that was as a dry run for getting a voice to Logfella, and then Craig decided that those were actually perfect for the voice, and there was no final recording. Um, and it, it provides this kind of unique thing, because any fan of Robert Ashley is going to hear Robert Ashley talking about the game, because he actually really cared about the game. Um, Further, and, and I think most importantly, it has this amazing fringe benefit of community building. It extends the reach of the entire independent game scene from just you know, the, the people in the scene to people outside of it. It, it draws in people of different talents and, and of different interests and, and lets them experience how amazing this community actually is and entices them to become more active in that community. So the next key component that I'm going to talk about uh, is making the concrete decision to be risky. Um, games probably shouldn't just trip and fall and end up being risky. Um, you should probably go into a project at least on, on a high level knowing what you're getting into. Um, and you should know that a risky project is risky and you should make the, the, the definite decision to leverage that risk to your benefit. So I personally believe that one of the scariest parts of the massive success of the iOS platform is that it's taught everyone, and in a lot of ways, especially independent developers, that they should try to make games for everyone. Seems like an obvious choice because games like Angry Birds and Fruit Ninja and Cut the Rope, and I could probably list a ton of others, sold 10 million, 20 million copies. Um, but believe it or not, I actually think that that's a really, really bad business move. Um, Everyone actually isn't a demographic. Everyone is not a target, and everyone are not the people that you care about as a game developer. Um, when you say everyone, when you say, oh, I'm making a game for everyone, it actually means that you're not really making a game for anyone. Um, everyone wants to make a, a million-selling game. That's a fact, and that's totally cool. But the problem with the hit-based mentality is it puts you in direct competition with all the other people who have the same hit-based mentality, the people that aren't uh, creative enough to make a unique game, and the people who aren't willing to take the risk necessary to develop something that actually has a soul or is fresh or go flies in the face of conventional wisdom. Uh, internally at Cappy, we always talk a lot about uh, playing the iPhone lottery. Uh, and basically, that's what happens when you try to compete against everyone else who's trying to do the same thing. You're trying to make the next Angry Birds, so what you're doing is basically walking up to a slot machine, putting the budget of your game into the slot, pulling the lever, and praying to God you get three fucking cherries. Um, in reality, one in 10,000 maybe do okay. Uh, maybe even worse than that. I don't even know the odds. Um, but instead, I really think that Sorcery provides some proof that there's another avenue to success on the iOS platform. And I do think that this actually does translate as well to other dis digital distribution platforms. It's not iOS-specific necessarily, but because uh, I should only talk about what I know, uh, that's all I'm going to do. Um, so I believe that you know, there is that kind of different path to success on iOS. Um, and to be clear, making a sports game or games for fans of arcade games isn't a niche. It's too wide, it's too generic, and it, and it doesn't actually allow you to do any direct speaking to the consumer base. Uh, for Sorcery, the niche that we targeted was, I'm going to air quote here, a culturally literate audience who are interested in style, the blending of games and art, and who want music to be a core component of game design. Uh, this is a very specific audience, or so we thought. Um, when we started making the game, we kind of thought, yeah, there's, that's probably 20,000 people. I don't know. Maybe enough people that we could probably make our money back on the project. Um, but we also didn't know if there was actually 2.5 million people in that niche or 20 million people in that niche. But we knew that it was a specific enough group of people that they would understand what we were saying to them. Um, another great example might be Kairosoft's micromanagement games where, uh, you know, to me, that style of game is, is extremely kind of niche yet it's, you know, games like Game Dev Story have been massive financial successes. 
Um, what we've learned and what I believe to be factually true is that due to the massive prolifer proliferation and popularity of iOS devices, you can have the seemingly smallest niche, and that niche can actually be quite large. Oh, cool. My, uh, my graph is gone. That's okay. That's, it's a mushroom. There's supposed to be some numbers on that slide, but it's not there anymore. Uh, that, that mushroom actually represents uh, a graph that shows that uh, two-thirds of our sales were on iPad and Universal. So just let's, we'll, put on the, we'll, we'll put on goggles and pretend that we see that. Um, so as I mentioned, we're targeting literate players. Because of this, we knew we could take steps after that to actually understanding who the audience for the game actually were and making real smart business decisions based on that. So one belief that came out of knowing who we were targeting was that many players who would care about sorcery would probably want to play it on an iPad. Uh, now, through this, we decided to like spend most of our time leading up to the game's launch making sure that the iPad version was as perfect as possible. Now, kind of in conflict with traditional business sense, which would say there's 10 times more iPhones than there are iPads, why not put it out for everything? Um, but for us, it was really more important to make sure that the people who we thought would be kind of like the core consumer to get the best experience possible first. Um, and in this case, uh, our hunch turned out to be pretty right because the game did extremely well, hit number four on iPad before even getting featured. Um, and perhaps one of the most interesting things is uh, two-thirds of all of our sales were on iPad uh, or once we turned it universal, universal. Um, and even more than that, over three-quarters of the entire revenue in the project was generated from those builds. Um, so when we went out and said, we think that these people are going to be on those platforms because we want to play it on those platforms, I think that that turned out to be correct. Um, and, and another kind of interesting fact about Sword and Sorcery on, on the kind of knowing your audience side is that only 10% of our total sales were generated during sale periods. So even when we put the game on sale like crazy, it still really didn't mean that much to us from a like, big kind of like, financial success standpoint. We knew that our, the people that we were making the game for were you know, the people in this room and the people like us, and we knew that if they were interested in this project, they would be interested enough to buy it at the price that we thought was correct for it. Um, and, and I think that that's pretty awesome. Now, like, I, I definitely don't want to stand up here and be that dude that says, like, you should make a game this way. This is the right way to do it. Only do it this way. Um, everybody, you know, should be making the games they want to make. But I also think that uh, if you love your project enough, you should be putting the effort in to make it stand out. Um, and it's very important that your game does that, that your game does stand out. Uh, because as we all know, digital platforms, especially the App Store, are a fucking sea of games. Um, and basically every day that C's tide rises is 10,000 or whatever it is, more games get added to the store. Um, in the case of Sword and Sorcery, you know, we were talking specifically about iOS, but I also do think that this is, you know, happening slowly but surely on other digital distribution platforms as well. Um, and the interesting thing about digital platforms is that while all the games are competing with each other, most of them are actually slightly different variations of the last one. Um, you know, shooter A, B, C, X, Y, and Z, or semi-generic real-time strategy A, B, C, or X, Y, Z. Um, and I personally think that the gamers out there are smart enough to know that going into a store. They're, they know that they're getting into a situation where they're going onto a platform that has thousands and thousands of games that are almost exactly the same. Um, different and risky games, in reality, are a very much rare thing. Um, on iOS, I, I, I'm going to throw out some numbers based on a complete and utter guess. Uh, I think maybe 1% to 2% on, of all games on iOS fall into that risky category. Um, so when standing out is so critical, is making something risky really that risky? Or is it actually riskier to make something uh, that doesn't stand out, something that is kind of more generic, or making design or business decisions to make your game appeal to a wider audience thus watering it down and eliminating some of the perceived risk, but actually making it uh, have much less, if no chance, of standing out on the platform. 
So the reason for this is pretty simple. Uh, there are a subset of gamers, uh, maybe a large subset of gamers, uh, who actually just want to play something new. Um, if you provide them something worth playing, you're not actually competing against 99% of the market. You're competing against the other risky games or the 1%. Uh, sure, you might not be reaching for the biggest slice of the money pie, but you're ensuring that your project has a really good chance of A, being successful, and B, being successful the right way, communicating with people that you care about as a game developer. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's, it's you know, really critical to, to spend the time to think about who you're making the game for. Um, I'm totally, I love games that are made by people for themselves. But the reality is, is that even when you're making a game for yourself, there's a whole lot of other people out there, a lot of them are in this room and a lot of them can't even make it here, that are the same as you. And they want to play your stuff. So the next component of the talk uh, dives into one of the hardest part of making a risky game. Uh, keeping calm in the face of insanely ridiculous piles of shit that you have to eat in order to complete a game. And then actually completing it the right way. So in short, I'm going to use the ridiculously overused adage of keep calm and carry on. The games that everyone in this room are, 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 are making uh, are probably the easiest games in the world to go over schedule and over budget. They're games that are trying to do outside of the known. They're usually experimental in some way, shape, or form. And they're pretty much always personal games. This is a dangerous concoction that means the schedules get missed and budgets get flushed down the toilet very easily. Um, and we all know that this is stressful as fuck. The stress isn't just a personal one. Uh, the like, I need to finish my game or we need to finish our game or we're a failure. Um, but it's also a business stress. Uh, so I had this discussion with some friends a while ago. Uh, and over the, the course of uh, this discussion, I came to this weird understanding that all independent developers are inherently entrepreneurs. There's, there's a, like a built-in entrepreneurial component of making and releasing your own stuff. Um, and while you're not necessarily looking at it as an entrepreneurial venture, while you're not thinking business first, if you're putting out a game to, a public, or to the public for sale, uh, that is something that you kind of have to come to terms with. Um, and going over budget, going over schedule, puts a significant amount of stress on the business component of what you're doing. Um, and this stress pretty much exclusively leads to making really stupid calls. Uh, I am over budget. I need to finish the game. I don't have any money, so I'll sign with a publisher because they're going to give me money. Uh, I might even not read the contract because, God, I just got to finish the game. Um, I, or another one is I'm over schedule. I'm terrified of losing my slot on a distribution platform. So I'm just going to hire a bunch of, of really smart people that I don't know to cram on the game for, for three months and finish it. Um, there's like a laundry list of those kind of like difficult and, and, and poor business decisions, decisions that come out of uh, the stress of your project going longer than you want it to. Um, but in the end, the only way to finish these games is to sacrifice something. The sacrifice is sometimes personal, and it's almost always a business sacrifice. Uh, and, but I, what I mean from sacrifice is, uh, you know, going to your parents and sucking it up and asking for some money. And I know pretty much uh, every project that uh, everybody's ever done has had that moment where you need to go somewhere and do something that requires you to just suck it up and ask for it. Um, and that's you know, that is a big sacrifice. You sacrifice pride. Or it even could involve, you know, changing uh, the scope of the project while not losing the vision. So uh, here's what happened to us, to the extreme during sorcery. <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of history here. Uh, after Chris and Craig and I sobered up after the meeting that we had at GDC where we uh, were super hammered and yelled each other and, and grabbed each other and shook each other about making a game, uh, we came back to Toronto and started planning out the actual collaboration that was going to be sorcery. We figured, yeah, shit, we can make a crazy little iOS game in eight to ten months. No, nope, yeah, no problem. And, and, and shit, we could probably fund it with like $110,000. That's crazy. That's lots of money. Um, 
So, you know, and we got a little bit, a little bit of help from the Ontario government, so we figured, well, shit, this, it's, this isn't risky, this is no problem, we're gonna, we're gonna totally hit this. And, and this was at a phase during, uh, Cappy's life when, you know, if, if it went over budget, it was gonna be a big fucking problem. Uh, so we put together the IGF GDC demo, uh, and, uh, Super Brothers Art won the IGF Mobile Art Award, and we were, you know, riding really high, and then we got back to Toronto and started working on the actual game. Uh, and then seven or eight months passed, and we kind of realized that we weren't even half done. Uh, so we had about two to three months from the original schedule to finish something that we kind of didn't even really know what it was. Um, so we were just kind of like trying to find the project, trying to figure out what it was, and this harsh reality set in. This project is going to go really, really long and really over budget. And so as one of the guys who was overseeing the whole kind of like schedule and financial component of the project, I stepped in and started making these kind of crazy plans to slash and burn sorcery to get it out in three months. Um, Craig, who was already knee deep in the project uh, and who trusted me, kind of came along on that ride and was like, yeah, okay, let's, let's cut all this crazy shit. Let's finish it in three months or so. Um, and at the time, because of the stress we had, uh, that seemed like the smart call. But it was really the stress talking. Um, so in a meeting with Cappy's creative director, Chris, uh, who at that time was starting to play a giant role in what the project became, uh, we kind of came to this understanding. And the understanding was that it was a far bigger risk to Cappy, to Super Brothers, and to Jim as a business to hustle through some half-baked game uh, and then throw it out. Um, we realized that finishing the game, finding more money, taking more time, was actually less of a business risk than throwing out garbage. Uh, so this risk required way more trust from everyone around. We had to trust that Chris and Craig together, together could solve many of the design issues around the project. I had to trust that Chris, playing a larger role in the project, could, could help be that driving factor that I personally couldn't be. Uh, we had to trust that Super Brothers could keep working on the project when his money had ran out and his soul was, was, was pushed to the brink uh, when he was at his darkest, mo darkest moment that he could actually go on. Uh, we had to trust that, that Jim would continue to work on the project and be a key part of that project long after his music had actually been created. Um, so the real big business decision and the one that had the biggest impact on sorcery was the intense belief in a very simple statement. A rush game will not sell as well as a finished game. In hindsight, this is doubly true with the projects that most people in this room create. They're riskier, they're more, uh, they're more explorative, um, and, and then by definition, an unfinished version of that is just not going to touch the right people. Another purely business component to that decision was these weird but insanely huge intangibles that come out of finishing a project correctly. Um, beyond the critical success of sorcery, we've had this kind of beautiful, beautiful storm of business benefit, all of which comes from the fact that we took the time to actually finish it. Um, I'm probably up here talking to everybody because there's this belief that sorcery was a hit. Uh, in a lot of ways, it really was. But if you compare it to what a hit is on iOS, we're like 10% of the way to a hit. You know, uh, 350,000 copies in typical iOS logic, does, a hit does not make. Um, but when we talk about the project with anyone, with everyone, the tone of the discussion is like, wow, you guys, you guys made something cool and it was a hit. And that kind of like really makes it easier to talk about making your next project with anyone whether it's the people around you or it's, it's a, a distributor like the App Store, like Steam, or like anything else. Finishing a game, especially a risky game, well, opens the, these immeasurable amount of doors for whatever you want to do next. And, and I really do think that it had this kind of fringe benefit for everybody involved. This isn't just a cappy benefit. I mean, I think a lot of the reason why Jim got to do such amazing music on... Uh, Indie Game the Movie was because Indie Game the Movie heard it, uh, the, uh, James and Lizanne heard it in Sorcery. And I think that that happened because the dialogue of the game was one of, like, this was a success. And, and I don't know about you guys, but I really, really like 
working on projects that when they're done, that's the tone. And it's really motivational. Okay, so here's a, here's, you know, I feel like I've kind of crammed in, like, this is my, like, fifth awesome buzzword uh, in my presentation. PR voice. What is that? That sounds stupid. Um, I apologize for that. But I, I think it's a very important lesson that we learned on, on, on the promotional side of the project, which was um, everyone working on the project understood the voice of the project. Um, and we could actually make the concrete decision to leverage that all the way through promotion of the game. We didn't just finish the game and then throw a bunch of like bullet points, like 55 different levels, you know, you can take a million steps. Um, we, just, we chose to make every part of the promotion of the game an extension of the vision of the game. So I got, I got a really uh, awesome uh, uh, chart here that I'm sure you all understand immediately, right? It makes total sense. So let me explain this a bit. Uh, normally, and especially when you're working with publishers, there's this waterfall flow that starts with the game vision. The vision informs the game. And then when the game is done, the game itself defines all the promotion for that game. Uh, and that's kind of stupid. Uh, in Sorcery, we took a completely different approach to that typical model. So the vision definitely informed the game, but the vision also informed the PR just as much as the game itself or more than the game itself. Uh, pretty much all of the promotion we did for the game, uh, the trailers, uh, Super Brothers, Teletext emails, uh, even the actual uh, sale periods for the game are tied into the vision for the project. Um, and, and that means that everything feels like a part of a whole. Why do you want to do this? Well, that, that sounds crazy still. Uh, so anyone who enjoys the promotions for the game will likely enjoy the game itself. It, it's much more honest, and it allows for honest communication between the act, you as a developer and the people who are going to be interested in your game. Um, you're not going to end up in a scenario where you trick someone into being interested in your game by selling them something that your game isn't if the promotion for the game is an extension of the vision of the game itself. Um, so promotion with vision will make your game stand out plain and simple. Uh, so we, we put out that Sword and Sorcery audience calibration trailer, um, and it's got 350,000 views just on the Vimeo alone. Um, and I think the main reason why people were attracted to that trailer was because the trailer wasn't really about the game. The trailer was about the tone of the game and, and the language of the game and the vision of the game. There's really not that much of the game in that trailer, but that trailer really did, like spoke about the game. Um, now another kind of like I talked a bit about like you know target target the the the, the niche like you know try to get 100% of the 10%. Um, and when you're communicating the vision rather than just selling bullet points, uh, you actually have this a really great communication with that niche. It, it gives them kind of like a, an extra step into your mind, and it gives them points to discuss them with you. So after that trailer came out, uh, Craig, fortunately, who is very Twitter friendly, uh, and Chris, who is very Twitter friendly, and myself, who pretty Twitter friendly had discussions with people about the trailer itself and how it, it related to the game. Um, okay, so also this is a business talk. Uh, so that means that I'm going to talk a bit about brand. <laughs> brand. Um, the, the thing that you don't want to do is try to force your game or the brand branding and brand of your game outside of a space that it doesn't exist in. You're not going to try to just say, like, all right, my game is going to do this, so I'm just going to shove all the, the marketing uh, in this direction so that it ends up being what I think it should be. Uh, using the vision that started and is the foundation of the project uh, as your kind of key informer for promotion allows you to just basically let it grow. You don't even have to worry about it. It's just going to do that. So even something as uh, specific as uh, Clive Holden, who's this uh, really awesome dude from Toronto who makes short films uh, and some new media stuff and a whole bunch of other things, uh, when uh, we convinced him to do the voice of the archetype in the trailer, it was this real obvious extension of the vision. Like, yeah, sure, of course our friend Clive is the voice of the archetype. Why wouldn't he be? And he sounds the way that he should sound. We didn't try to like go out and hire some like awesome voice actor. Um, we we found people who we really thought fit the vision of the game and also the vision of the development. 
So how do you do this? Uh, I'll run through this very quickly. Take the core values, the ideas, the aesthetics, the tone, and the soul of the game, and just let that be the promotion. You know, uh, I, Kurt is going to come up here and talk about how to make rad trailers, and you should listen to everything he has to say because pretty much all he does is make rad trailers. But I think the reason why they work so well is because they're not, they're, they're all about having soul. They're all about pr like putting something out there that speaks about the game. Um, another big thing is maintaining a common written voice for stuff like web and promotion and trailers and social media uh, and, and so on. Like making sure that it all sounds the way that you want it to sound. Um, now this is going to sound like I, I feel kind of dumb saying this, uh, but uh, don't use fonts that you don't use in the game in your promotion. Don't use colors that you don't use in the game in the promotion. Don't use sound effects that you source from a site that you just found in order to just have that one sound in the trailer. None of it is going to feel like a cohesive piece, and none of it is going to end up with a common vision. Um, make, make good trailers. That's, that's a pretty good one. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest thing is, if you have a, multiple people working on a project, even if you're one of those people that really likes working with, with PR companies or whatever, make sure the people who uh, informed and had the, the vision of the game are actually directly involved in promotion. Um, it's, it's so easy to promote your game correctly when someone who cares about it is talking about it. Um, and I think we all know that there's a lot of gamers out there who care about who makes their games. Um, and you can make that a part of how you talk about your game. You can tell that story of your game by you know, being the person who cares the most about the game and being in front of people. So here, here's some direct sorcery examples of how we did that. Uh, Chris and Craig wrote all the promotional text for everything we did. Uh, Craig always gave a final pass to all the text to make sure that it sounded like sorcery. Um, Every single solitary thing we did had to share the sorcery tone. It had to have some mysterious elements. It had to have a couple of tongue-in-cheek jokes while still kind of being serious. It always had to have music at the forefront. Um, even if it wasn't even video, there were often times that we were thinking about what music would fit what we were talking about, even though we were just making promotional still art. Um, there's also kind of uh, 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 amazing things that can happen through giving voices to characters when you can't even do voice, um, like I talked about with Clive, but also just you know, the way that you think about the characters and how you're able to you know, write text thinking about how they sound. Um, in the case of sorcery, a lot of the promotional art added characters to the world even though they weren't in the game. So there's a lot of like weird doctors and children and knights and horses and monsters in the promotional artwork, none of which appear in the game, but all of which seem to help build out the vision of what sorcery was. Uh, so even shit like putting out sales on the solstices. So the only time that sword and sorcery goes on sale is during uh, each solstice, spring solstice, winter solstice, all of that. Uh, even when we, we time sales is based on the vision for the game. The soundtrack releases itself was a big component of the vision of the game. From the very beginning, one of the pieces of the vision was to get Jim's music out there specifically on vinyl. And so doing that was like a key part of promoting the game while maintaining that, that kind of like really intense vision. So let's go to the next slide here. There we go. So uh, in conclusion, take some risks, collaborate to make your project better, Keep calm in the face of insurmountable odds and think of promotion as an extension of your vision. Super easy. Just, you know, <laughs> no problem. So for me, uh, traditionally independent developers are known for making unique and risky games. Um, and this is kind of like my, th this isn't actually the real conclusion. This is just like a kind of a plea to, to people. Um, so we're, normally the people in this room are making, you know, the most interesting, unique, risky games, and a lot of you seem like you're going to be making stuff on iOS. Uh, so please make risky stuff on iOS. We all want to play it. And we, all, we all want to play the stuff that you guys are going to make uh, on a platform that doesn't have that much of them on it. Um, but just make sure the game's awesome. Thank you. Go.
Cool. Uh, do people want to ask questions and stuff? Some people want to ask them. Okay, yeah, cool. Uh, you talk about collaboration a lot. Um, do you ever, did, during the process, did you ever have a problem with team members trying to pull the vision or the game in different directions from each other? Well, I, I think that, well, in the case of Sword and Sorcery, the entire, like, the, the, the whole thing started based on a vision. Like, it, it was always kind of about, the, you know, this one kind of overarching idea. And uh, I think that the fact that, like, Chris... Craig, Jim, bought into that from the very beginning. Um, even when one of the three or two of the three wanted to go in a different direction, there was always that chance to say, just like, we all know what this game is supposed to be because we, you know, we know what this is. Um, and, I mean, really for us, it, it, we never ended up in a scenario where people were trying to take the... I mean, probably the most obvious chance that we had to take the project in a different direction was when we were like, fuck, we got to get it out really quick. Um, and in that case, there was always somebody to bring us back to that point where, like, nope, this is the vision of the game. Um, and it did help a ton that the foundation of the game was, like, we already knew Craig's art. We already knew Jim's music. We already knew that Cappy could put games out and, 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 and you know, have had a really strong design sensibility. So we knew that there were going to be problems, but everybody kind of knew coming in what they all added to the project. So I don't know if that... I, I feel like that did not answer your question at all, but... Sorry. I'm wondering if you could say more about what, what exactly you mean by standing out. Or maybe you just mean be awesome. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think standing out is kind of this, like, byproduct of making a game that, A, you care about, but, B, isn't safe. I mean, I think the easiest way to stand out is to make something weird as shit or, make, like, make something that just basically flies right in the face of what everyone else is doing, uh, as long as you care about doing that. I'm definitely not advocating that everybody should drop the project they love to make something that they think is weird. Um, but I, I think that people should not be afraid of making those weird games or not be, you know, embrace it and love it and then talk about why it's weird. Like, don't, don't try to hide the weirdness in, in, you know, making a really, you know serious publisher style trailer or putting out press releases with like you know official company letterhead or whatever just you know own up to what you're making and, and talk about it the way that, that you feel about it and I think a lot of that does help with the standing out but I mean most of all I think it's about thinking like okay uh, what do I want to make and how like how do I think how do I talk about it and a lot of games that aren't even that super strange, even ones that have a small strange component, that's the component that often excites the game developer or the person making it. And so not being afraid to talk about that piece of it, I think is really important when it comes to standing out. Um, you talked a lot about uh, the PR as like a afterthought kind of of the game. And I was wondering, one of the things I thought was really awesome about the game was the way that you the, the whole concept was kind of based almost around this kind of PR message or um, kind of like, it was almost like this ingenious marketing scheme. I don't know, like, if you could talk about that a little bit. Do you mean like the, the, the Twitters? Right, or, like the Twitter or, stuff and also the whole idea of the real world events like the cycle of the moon. Yeah. Kind of organizing the fan base to be talking about it at certain times. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to, like... You know, Cappy's been around for quite a while, uh, so it's hard for us not to think about promoting stuff, even when we're making it. But all of the decisions made in developing the game were made uh, because we thought it was better for the game, not because we thought it would be good PR. Like, the entire Twitter component of the game was never conceived to be a PR or marketing component. I mean, you know, everybody knew that it might have this fringe benefit of doing it, but, you know, the core behind the Twitter integration or the core behind the moon phases was because, you know, we thought it was a really awesome piece of the design puzzle that was sorcery or the vision puzzle that was sorcery. I mean, I think, like, you know, anybody who's making games nowadays thinks about, like... If, if the plan is to commercially release it, pretty much everybody's thinking about how they're going to commercially release it even while they're making it. And so that does kind of inform the decisions, but I don't, I don't think at any time during the development of, of Sorcery we were like, we really want to do this thing, but it'd be way better for promotion if we did that thing. Um, and, and I honestly think that that's part of like, you know, making something that's easy to promote. You know, people smell marketing ideas from a mile away these days. You know, it... it People are a lot smarter than I think 
you know, a lot of us give them credit for. And they know when something is done from the heart and something is done just because you think it'll sell 20,000 more copies. So yeah, I do, like, we definitely thought a lot about promotion. We talked a lot about trailers before we were anywhere close to being finished just because we were really excited about the vision of the game and because we knew that we could make something cool in trailer format or in, like, we knew Craig could make really rad promotional art. So, yeah. Let's go over, bounce over there. So whenever any small studio embarks on an entrepreneurial venture, it's always a, ah, okay, let's just push this boulder down the hill and pick up the moss and the experiences we go, and we just yeah. have to take what we get. Um, it, invariably, you'll have a world of things that you didn't know that you didn't know. What did you learn from this process that you didn't know when you started, which you would embark to people uh, pursuing this? Um, good question, yeah. Like that. Um, <laughs> like I, I definitely think that. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll speak for for Cappy specifically. Um, we spent a lot of time making. Like we spent a bunch of time doing contract work. We spent a while after that working with some publishers, um, and we made some decisions that were based on. Oh, this is a smart business move. They'd like this is the right business call. Well, well, you know, we made Critic Crunch and, and Clash of Heroes, so we should make another puzzle style game because that's you know someone's going to fund it. It's a perfect idea. Um, and this project, uh, I mean, this is something that we had talked about a bunch in the studio before, but this project really solidified the belief that um, any business call that you make because it's a safe business call is actually the least safe business call of all time. Um, it's those are the inherent risks. Those are the ones that you get fucked by contracts. Those are the ones that you get, you know, screwed into putting some, or you screw yourself into putting something out that you don't care about, and then you can't actually promote it because everybody knows that you're just talking about something you don't care about. Um, so definitely, I, I think that you know, going into it knowing that like doing the thing that matters the most is probably the best business call you can make uh, was a really important learning. Um, and I think another one is is you know really. I've, I've worked with, with like, the people at Cappy, the founders of Cappy, for a really long time, uh, and I just I, I know when to trust them. I know, you know when they make a call that it's, it's the right call. When you bring people in, uh, like, you know, I, I knew Craig and I kind of knew Jim when we started. Um, it's really hard to, like, let them into that same trust level as people that you've known, like, for in the case of, like, Chris, like, 13 years. Um, so I think one of the, th the other thing that I learned is that the sooner or the faster that we try, got like, you know, went out for a few beers uh, or a lot of beers um, and had, you know, just time to like talk about, talk together about the project and the endeavor we were going on, the sooner we were able to like just skip over that whole like, I don't know if I trust this guy. Um, I mean, we obviously trusted him right away because we set out to make the game right away, but it kind of helped get us over that hump when, you know, Craig would fight for something or Jim would fight for something and I knew it was going to push the schedule or we knew it was going to add more money, you could just kind of say, okay, it's, I, I know what he's talking about and I, and I trust that. Fight, fight. Quick one. Okay, go. PC version, question mark. Um, no comment, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, speaking of uh, PR, I was wondering, um, y you didn't mention one thing that I, I, I found to be incredibly important, and that's a product demo, like a, a playable product demo, because when uh, we've been promoting our games, uh, you know, we, we've been putting, you know, oh, hey, there's a, 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 there's a trailer for, uh, uh, for Reseteer up, and it's uh, up on game trailers, and oh, it's already lost in the sea of trailers, and nobody actually cares, but when we... Uh, Put out the uh, uh, the demo for Resetier back in uh, uh, like July of uh, 2010. Our servers literally began belching fire, and people were begging Steam to to, to pick us up. And for I'm sure. wondering if uh, is it different on iOS? Like, you know, do demos get lost the same way? Uh, Full games get lost due to the, uh, the way the App Store works. Demos do you... don't really exist, really, on the App Store. I mean, they kind like you can kind of maybe do that. I, I I don't I don't really know the exact logistics, but you can't call anything a demo. You can have like a light version or some shit like right. that. But um, so maybe it's just semantics, and you can demo what you want. But um, yeah. I I do think that uh, like we put sorcery in people's hands. 
uh, early, not even like knowing that it was going to be that early. Um, like after two months of making a, few, a small little like prototype, we basically put it in people's hands. Um, and then we went quiet for a really long period of time when we weren't ready to uh, sell the game or even talk about the game. Um, but then when we were start ready to, ready to show it again, we did go and put it in, in people's hands. And um, we, we never really shied away from letting anybody interested play it, press okay. or whatever. But yeah, I do think it's a little like it's. I don't think that you can do on on iOS what you can do on Steam when it comes to that style of like getting it out there. That, that style of you know a, a selling it through, through a demo. Yeah, basically like okay. let people try it first and then decide if they want to. I mean, you could. There are ways you could probably do it on iOS, but I, I don't think that it's built into the like consumer's mindset to mm. to do things that way. Okay. You? Yeah, you. Oh, yeah, okay. I was um, just saying hi to Mike. <laughs> that powerful, uh, cohesive vision that you talk about that uh, informs the PR, is that something that you had crystallized from the start of the project or was something that continued to coagulate and form up until the moment of release? Well, there was, I mean, there were core components of it that basically, like, you know, spread out into more ideas, but there was that kind of, like, you know, make a game with soul, uh, a record you could hang out in, uh, really about Craig's visual style, uh, and, and, and really about, like, um, you know, really about when you play the game, it's not about, you know, pressure or whatever. It's just this, you know, experience that you're, you know, chilling out in Jim's music, looking at Craig's art, and then having that kind of flowing experience. But then from there, like, a ton of different stuff sprouted out of it. But at any time that stuff would spread out, it would kind of always come back to, does that fit into this, like, the guts of it all? Um, and I think that that, I mean, for us, uh, like, the people on the project just kind of did that. I mean, that's not something that we had to kind of set out or, like, mandate, like, every idea, put the, do, do you give it the, like, original sorcery vision stamp of approval? Um, it just kind of, like, it existed and people understood it. And I think that's how, like, when, when, when we talk about collaboration, it was such a great experience because... You know, Chris and Craig and Jim just, they just got it. They, they didn't really have to spend a lot of time. I mean, most of the time that there was disagreements, it was kind of like, um, <laughs> how central to the sorcery vision is it? Rather than like, I really want to do this thing like a mile away, and that's, it's, it's that or break. Thank you. Hey. Uh, so I heard about your talk at Indiecade, which I think was similar to this one. Uh, there was like the, the first couple of slides was similar. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I heard like the gist of part of it was like don't try to make Angry Birds because it's a lottery and you're not going to win. And it kind of like and and do it something for the ten percent, which I totally think is cool. Um, but I've also can't count the number of times that I've said in a meeting or someone else has said in a meeting recently on my new two projects that. Well, Angry Birds didn't like this, so... Or Cut the Rope is like this, and we should do something like that. And it's kind of like, is it... Do you, do you think that it's wrong to try to make something with a super broad appeal because, like, the game will suffer, or because you actually think that a game like Angry Birds released at the same time as Angry Birds will make zero money compared just because it is a lottery, or... Like, cause I, I, I feel like capturing 10% of Angry Birds or 5% of Angry Birds will pay for me for 10 years, so. <laughs> like, It'll pay for everyone in this room for I'm, 10 I'm years. I'm okay with only picking up, like, a tiny percentage of what Angry Birds yeah. will do, but I think, like, a broad-based appeal game, like, that's what I'm working on. I don't know. Like, well, I, I, don't, I'm I, I definitely or, don't want to, like, make it sound like I don't think people should make a, a game that has broad appeal. I... I, I I think that you should know what you're making going into it, right? Like, you know that you're competing against a much huger number of people, right. of developers, uh, many of whom uh, have, like, EA to pull the sale switch, meaning that they can ruin the entire app store for a week by putting all their games on sale right. when they launch a game. Um, that happened to us during Sorcery and had no effect on it. And I think that that was because it was... You know, in a different side. Sure. But I think when it when it comes down to and and I, I was really weary about parts of this talk because I, it does make it sound like I'm like, no, don't do it the way that you want to do it. Do it this way. This is the right way. And I don't think that's the case. But I think that like I think it's actually you're actually incapable of making a game that has the same approach as Angry Birds. 
um, you're automatically going to have like a design perspective, a creative perspective, a, an aesthetic perspective that right. puts it in a different class. Well, that's where I, I worry. Like, are you saying like I'm trying to be something that I'm not, and no. therefore I'm going to make a game that's not? Like, if I'm trying to be like Angry Birds, then I'm not going to, it's going to be like half and half and not as good. No, no, no. I, I think, I think it's more like the components of like, you can make, make an, make a, an Angry, well, don't make an Angry Birds clone. But like, you can make, you can make a game that, that fits the exact same mentalities, uh, the exact same kind of like sensibilities, the exact same goals. But if you do it like the way that, you know, you're passionate about, and if you do it, um, you have like a vision for the game. Um, you know, you know, like, basketball like when I look at that I'm not that I don't think I think that that's a game that could reach a mass market um, but I don't think that its goal is to compete with Angry Birds I think it's being made by it you know it's a really interesting unique game even though the target audience might be wider than sorcery um, so I think kind of like hopefully the, the the message that doesn't get lost is that like even though you're to me playing the lottery is starting a game to try to make Angry Birds, sure. To try to hit Angry Birds success, like saying like, oh shit, I got I got three months, I can make, I, I can make cut the rope. Here I go. Um, if you start the project with that in mind, I think that's when you're actually directly competing with everyone else outside of this room at this conference because they're all seeing the dollar signs flashing in their face. But if you're starting out saying, I got this great idea for a game, uh, I, I really think that this is like an awesome idea. I can really like. You know, I can make something rad out of this, and it just so happens that it's also in the kind of more mass markets. I think I don't think you're in the same space. Okay. I don't think you're setting yourself up to to try to like, you know, I'm going to sell this game to everyone. Uh, that's not the way you're approaching it. It, it might be more mainstream, but it uh, I'm going to air quote mainstream because I don't even know if that's the case. But it, it might be more mass market focused than say something targeting a niche niche. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're just pulling that lottery. You know what you're getting into, and you know the game that you're making. Whereas you're not just making money and wrapping a game around it, or trying to make money and wrap a game around it. Cool. I'm done. All right. Sorry, guy over there.